Hello and welcome to our today's webinar with the topic Double Spindle Machine with a Robotic Cell Space Saving Design and Double Power for Side and Opinion Gears Production. My name is Sarah Muche and I'm very pleased to welcome again so many of you to our webinar. I welcome very warmly Bjorn Swartek and Daniele Lopocchio from the global sales team of EMAC. Another guest is Kirk Stewart from EMAC LLC and he's right now located in the US but directly connected to us in the studio. So far from my side and I directly hand over to Kirk and wish an interesting webinar. So thank you very much, Sarah. So I'm sitting here in Farmington Hills, Michigan. We're going to do our webinars a little bit differently, perhaps than uh, other webinars you've seen a little bit more live person interaction. You know, as Sarah mentioned, please do enter your questions. We want to have uh, an open dialogue, so to speak. So we've chosen uh, the side and pinion gears that lie within differential housings, uh, you know, with intent. Um, differential housings are also a great component for EMAG, but the fact of the matter is this is a high volume, highly accurate, uh, very demanding type component. And when you combine that high volume, high accuracy component, this is where EMAG really comes to play. So with uh, about 100 million vehicles being uh, manufactured worldwide, uh, and we think about two-wheel drive versus four-wheel drive, you know, the quantities of parts really goes through the roof. So it's been very good for us, and we certainly would like to share with you today about the VL1 uh, twin as well as the VL3 duo. So at this point, I'll hand it over to uh, Daniele and Bjorn to uh, kick us off. Thank you very much, Kirk, um, and also a warm welcome from my side. So we are currently located here in Salach in Germany in the headquarter of, of, of EMAC. And I would like to start with you, uh, first of all, to introduce to you um, our content, our agenda. And today we will introduce to you two different kind of solutions uh, which will help you to produce bevel gears. So first of all, I will call it the so-called entry-level machine, our VL1 twin machine. Twin stands for a two spindle machine concept, but both spindles, spindle one and spindle two, they are producing simultaneously absolutely the same part. So this is the twin concept. And uh, this is normally the right machine if you have some simple bevel gear processes. So if you only need four tools, no rolling process maybe is required, then this is the right machine, a very price sensitive product. Uh, and and um, Kirk will let you know some more highlights later. Secondly, I would like to introduce to you our bestseller, the VL3 Duo. The Duo concept compared to the twin concept stands for two working areas, so two spindles with two turrets, and they can work independently and you can do OP10 and OP20 on one machine. But in this specific case of, uh, for producing bevel gears, we will also use the VL3 Duo as a twin machine, so we will also do OP10, OP10 on this kind of machine. So, yeah, this is uh, my introduction. First of all, we start with a, with a clamping of the bevel gear. So this is normally challenging and I would like to hand over to Daniela. Daniela has a technical background as a, as a tool engineer and um, he's very, very familiar with clamping solutions for bevel gears. Thank you very much to Björn and Kirk. Very welcome also from my side. Thanks a lot to join us and I will start now directly with the clamping situation what is a very important point in technology of bevel gears. What you can see here in the chuck body, we are using a negative, that means we are orientation the part in the right position and to locating them in the chuck body. You can see here, we have the face clamping fingers. We take them to take the body, the workpiece, in direction of the workpiece, uh, of the clamping chuck. Then we are clamping the part and can manufacture them the turning operations. In the second clamping situation, we have the pins, and the pins can also orientate very long part. We need these pins to orientate the teeth, and with the face clamping fingers, we are using the part facing direction of the chuck body. You can see here, these are chucks which we get from a sub supplier, also we are making these chucks in-house in EMAC. Thank you, Bjorn. Thank you very much. Before we turn to the process of machining bevel gears, I would like to introduce the VL1 twin a little bit more in detail to you. So first of all, let's focus on the technical basic figures. So we are talking about a cylindrical working area. So the maximum workpiece diameter is 75 millimeters. Same to the workpiece length, it's uh, 75 millimeters as well. So we have uh, water-cooled motor spindles made by, by Emacs, so we do not use suppliers. So this is our homemade 
so-called uh, EMAC motor spindle which we are using here. This is uh, a spindle water-cooled in standard for highest thermal stability. We also have our EMAC patented turret also with a direct driven torque drive for rotation uh, for the rotation of the of the uh, turret disc inside the machine. It's also water cooled and uh, a very good basis in order to produce highly accurate bevel gears. Finally, the machine comes with a funnel zero I control, which um, yeah, which is very common in the in the file of production turning machines. And um, yeah, before I hand over to Kirk, I would like to draw your attention to two specific highlights of the machine. So first of all, uh, I would like to introduce the, the two motor spinners a little bit more in detail to you. Very challenging for, for a, turn, a twin concept machine is normally you have to uh, enable the customer to, um, um, to adjust spindle number one to spindle number two after a tool change. So it looks as if, as if the, the two spindles are mechanically connected, but they are not. They are only connected by software and they can move totally independently in X axis as well as in, in, in Z axis. And this gives you the flexibility after a tool change to adjust spindle number one to spindle number two, which is, as I told you, very important for a twin concept machine. Second highlight I would like to draw your attention on is our uh, x-axis drive. So we, ch we have chosen a linear motor for the x-axis so you can see the permanent magnets on the machine and beside every spindle there's one individual uh, linear motor so that the, uh, that the spindle can move as I told you independently in x-direction. And uh, yeah, normally linear motors have, have many different uh, um, advantages. First of all, the high dynamics. Secondly, um, the high accuracy. And the high accuracy is the reason why we've chosen this component. So as I told you, after two change, change, we need high accuracy in order to adjust the spindles. And that's why we picked out the linear motor concept. Now I would like to hand over to, to Kirk. Um, he can explain to you the more highlights of the machine based on a, on a 3D animation. Okay, so this video, the first thing you're gonna see is uh, the overall um, picture of the machine. And what should highlight uh, be highlighted here is a really small footprint, about 50 square feet. Um, to be able to get two parts off of a machine in that small of a footprint uh, is really packing quite the punch in a really small floor space. So we do have different automations. You see that little bit of a, a tunnel through the machine. We'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later. So the first thing you're going to see here is the machine base. Uh, this is a cast granite or an engineered polymer granite um, machine bed. This offers great thermal stability through the day, through the week, through the season. Um, it's also great for dampening of vibrations, it offers you better tool life, 25 to 30 percent better tool life through that vibration dampening. Um, here we have the cross slide and the vertical slide. Um, as Bjorn mentioned, it's totally independent on the X and Z axes uh, with our direct drive motor spindles. Um, here we're going to see that independent movement, which allows us to maintain uh, the great accuracy on this machine. Uh, tied in with uh, each of the axes, all EMAG machines have linear glass scales. Uh, next, we're going to focus on the turret. Um, the turret has only four sides, which is totally sufficient uh, in the case of small diameter, half, fast cycle time type components. Um, next, we're going to show the load unload here. Um, it's currently in the pre a position to unload the components with the raw parts uh, laying in wait, um, is, which is a very fast um, process of about five seconds. Next, and very importantly, is the probe in between the work area and the uh, load unload area that allows us to use this as a um, after tool change probe, as well as a production post-process gauge. So there's the VL1 twin um, video and highlights. You can find this on our YouTube channel as well. Our first question already come up from the audience. Um, how much is the shortest cycle time for the machine? Yeah, normally, if we, uh, if we receive um, requests in this regards, we normally choose a robot cell, which is quite fast. And um, yeah, I, I give you an example. Um, for bevel gears, it will come also later in the presentation. You will see that a robot cell, an, an efficient robot cell, needs around 11 seconds for loading and unloading of the, of the machine. 
And if you consider <clears throat> that the VL1 Twin has a chip-to-chip -chip time of around five or even less seconds, uh, you, you can, or consequently, the lowest possible cycle time is around six seconds. Um, yeah, this is my experience. Is it in line with you? Yeah, how Bjorn said, it depends uh, first from the automation strategy, what customer <coughs> has, you want to do something with a gantry system for track motion or my automation of a robot cell, but it depends from our chuck or our material and also from the tools. But we have solutions or projects where we have done nine to 10 seconds until 24, 30 or 40 seconds. Thank you. And what are the advantages of this machine compared to a horizontal machine? Yeah, this question I would like to directly hand over to, to Kirk to give uh, you as the audience uh, the experience from the US market. So no doubt the highest running machine tool on the market is your standard horizontal two axis machine. You know, standard configuration, work head on the left and turret traversing and feeding into the parts. You know, EMAG was the first company to go to the inverted vertical self-loading solution in the early 90s. And this continues to be our bread and butter today. So the benefits are, are clear from our standpoint. You know, first and foremost, the chips are falling down. Well, what, what does that mean for you? With the chips falling down, it's better for the work piece, especially if you're cutting taller parts and machining an ID, you have no recutting of chips, better surface finish, so on and so forth. The other big benefit is clear is that your chips are falling down. When your chips are falling down, you are creating an environment where the machine is going to perform over time much better with many fewer maintenance costs. All your coolant and chips are falling down and all your scales and rails and cables, all that stuff is above and uh, behind uh, anything in a vertical man, uh, vertical means. So it's a very good standpoint uh, from the maintainability of the machine. The other big benefit of going vertical in this case is the floor space, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, again, consider that conventional horizontal machine with a headstock, with a workpiece length and consideration for a tailstock. And all of a sudden your floor space, you know, is pretty big. Uh, by going vertical, we, we constrain all this uh, by focusing on chucked parts in this particular instance and not thinking about a tailstock. So very good for the maintainability of the machine, very good for the, the workpiece processing and very advantageous for the workpiece or for the, for the machine footprint. Yeah, now I would like to move on with the, with the first application sample, which we have done on our VL1 Twin for tools. And I would like to hand over to Daniela. Thank you to Bjorn and Kirk. Yeah, here can, we can see a traditional process what, which we have done on a wheel one twin. We have here a cycle time round about 25 seconds. We need round about cutting time 20 seconds, another five seconds for loading, unloading. And here we have the possibility to make with four tools the complete process. It means we are using four tools on our wheel one twin and every 25 seconds we get uh, two finished parts in, in this machine. In the next step, you can see all the tools that we are using in these operations. We are working a lot with combination tools together. Here you can see we save enough places. There we are using in picture one uh, outside turning tools and in picture two we are uh, finishing the, uh, with the outside turning tools, the operations. In the second step, you can see we are using the inside turning tools of the spherical and inside the, the cylindrical bar. And on the right side, you see the turret overview, how is equipped our turret. Now I give a hand over to Bjorn with the wheel drawn twin with the robot cell. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I can shortly interrupt for, the, for our next question. What about machine main maintainability? In this case, the machine is too small. How are the spaces for maintenance activities? So, so no doubt, uh, you know, our machines are not invincible. They're not made of kryptonite. You know, they will um, require maintenance. So, you know, we live in the high volume automotive space. It's uh, the norm that uh, we do have to have preventative maintenance. And we certainly consider these things in our designs. Um, all the components are very accessible. Um, if we were to go back to the video and, and you'd see that all the panels uh, for the critical uh, aspects of the machine, be it the, the guideways and whatnot, everything is very easy to get into. Um, but, you know, the smaller the machines get, in some regards, they do get more challenging in that regard, but certainly it's been considered uh, in the overall design of the machines. Thank you, Kirk. So 
Now I would like to focus the or put the focus a little bit on the automation. So normally we can uh, include to the machine different kind of automation. Doesn't matter if we are in, if we are including a, port, a portal, if we are or a gantry, sorry, a gantry solution. If we integrate our uh, our own. Uh, um, gantry solution, the so-called track motion. We can also offer a robot solution and normally in this case of the production of bevel gears we are very often choosing uh, an efficient um, robot cell. Um, here I would like to give you a very simplified part flow which, uh, which shows you that loading unloading takes around 11 seconds so normally the pickup spindles they put the parts on the pickup then the swivel table needs two seconds to rotate by 180 degrees. Then we have three seconds loading, three sec uh, seconds uh, or unloading, three seconds loading of the, of the parts. Then the turret takes another two seconds to swivel back. And then we consider, let's say, roughly one second more to change from raw part to finished part. In total, 11 seconds or a little less. And um, yeah, if you listen to the presentation of Daniele, he just told you that for very simple bevel gears we have tech time or cycle time of 25 seconds. And the big advantage of robot cells is that in this case you have 14 uh, seconds left to do some additional operation like cleaning, like uh, measuring. And yeah, that's why very often we are using um, robot solutions. With which robot manufacturers do you work together? So I'll take that one, Bjorn. So, you know, EMAG uh, is accustomed to working with all robot manufacturers, um, you know, be it ABB, KUKA, uh, FANUC, you name it. Um, here at EMAG LLC, we are a level one integrator of uh, FANUC robots. So very comfortable for us in this regard. But at the end of the day, uh, this is entirely uh, dependent on customer specification and desire. Thank you, Kirk. Um... I will pass directly back to you um, in order to describe to our audience uh, the, the robot cell. So what we're going to see here is a very simple video showing a, a robot picking from a, a basket. Uh, EMAG offers uh, basketizing systems as well, not a simple stationary one like this, but uh, multiple stacks, so on and so forth. Um, you also see in the robot cell a post-process gauge. Uh, as Bjorn mentioned, this could be a, a wash box. This could be many different things. Uh, but point being, this is very fast. So here we are loading onto the swivel table. Um, we just picked up the parts on the back side of that swivel table. We go in for the machining, uh, four tools worth of uh, machining in this case. As Daniele showed, this could be eight inserts perhaps by using gain tooling. Uh, but ultimately, very fast processing for small parts. Now we're going to drop the parts off, and in parallel, we're doing the load on load on the opposite side of that swivel table. So back to Bjorn's uh, illustration, the robot time uh, is required is about 11 seconds. So if my load on load um, time at the machine between the swivel table and the spindles is uh, five seconds, you know that allows me to have a machining time. Uh, down to six seconds. So if we are machining at 11 seconds, or I'm sorry, machining at six seconds and loading and unloading at five for an 11 second tack time, that's giving you a component every five and a half seconds. And while we're speaking about side and uh, pinion gears today, you know, there are, there are tons of other components out there outside of the automotive industry in a lot of cases that do have high volumes behind them where this type of machine definitely has a, a place. Thank you very much. So I hand over to Daniele for the introduction of our VLC Duo machine. Thanks to Bjorn and Kirk. Yeah, we are starting now with our best seller machines, VLC Duo, our modular standard machine. The big difference from this machine to the VL1 Twin, we have here two separate working areas. It means we can do two times OP10 or two times OP20 or OP10 in the OP20. Uh, we have here uh, two turrets, which are equipped with 12 turret stations. And we have also the possibility to choose a live tool motor to do drilling and milling operations on this live tool. And we have here a 32 kilowatt, a really strong spindle, which we can really do heavy duty cutting of steel. Yeah, the machine is uh, absolutely more, really rigid. We have here the possibility, how I said, also to use a probe to measure the parts in the machine and to correct them if this is necessary. In the next step, we can see the application sample about bevel gear machining with rolling. 
and here we have also the possibility to see a robot cell which is integrated between two machines. This shows our flexibility of the machine. The robot cell can do here, uh, let's say, feed and unfeed the conveyor and also using um, a washing box in the background, also a measuring probe or a gauge unit. This is from the top view, the layout of this line. And the next step, we have the cycle time and the process about the bevel gear, which is included the rolling of the spherical. Here we have a cycle time around about 36 seconds. Why we have here 36, we included here the rolling of the spherical and also the rolling of the central bar. We have here around about a cutting time of 30 seconds and loading unloading around about five to six seconds. Um, are there already installed machines in the USA and what are the references? So absolutely we have machines installed in the USA. Um, we've been installing machines in the US uh, since the early 90s. So to date we have over 2,000 machines installed in various uh, industries, very various regions around the states. We've gone from Maine to Florida to California to to Washington. Really, we are covering all gamuts. I think we're in uh, 35 states around the country. So we have a very strong install base. Again, it's not just us in the Midwest in automotive, uh, but in other industries as well. Um, no doubt in the case of the VL1 twins and the VL3 duos, uh, those are the, definitely the high runners for EMAG. Uh, lots of machines out in the field and certainly we'd uh, love to introduce you to some of those customers who are using those machines today. So um, if you have specific uh, interest in seeing a machine in the field, by all means reach out to your local regional sales guy uh, or any of the other market companies and see machines that are actually on the shop floor. Um, here in EMAG LLC, for those that don't know, uh, we do offer full turnkey services um, locally. It means we have the engineering, project management, and all the typical infrastructure um, that would re be required. So, so for any turning or simple grinding operations, we've got you covered here in Farmington Hills. Thanks, Kirk. Are there milling options for the double spindle machines? Yeah, this is one of the, the biggest differences between the VL1 Twin as well as the VL3 Duo. The VL1 Twin comes with a four position um, turret, so four tool stations for each spindle, in total eight. But they are all uh, available as fixed tools, so there's no live tool or live live tool unit uh, which can be added. So this machine was, was, uh, was designed uh, uh, in order to keep the investment um, on, a, on the lowest possible level. If we need more flexibility, as for example, um, what, what Daniela mentioned, if we want to include rolling processes and if we want to uh, yeah, need more tools, so if we need uh, a C axis uh, and, and, and a live tool unit, then we normally switch to the VLC Duo. So this machine is equipped, so each spindle is equipped with a 12 position. A turret and all uh, positions can be equipped with uh, with a driven tool unit, so we can add boring boring tools, uh, milling tools, and this and both um, sides of the machine, so both working areas can also be equipped with a Y axis, with, which is integrated in the turret. So yes, we can we can offer this, but for the VL3 Duo only. And I'll, I'd like to follow up with that. You know, within Emag's complete uh, product portfolio. You know, we have turning as our bread and butter, as I stated previously, but um, we also have special applications that are really uh, intended to be used as milling machines. You know, our KBU machines, in the case of CBA milling, is a double spindle machine uh, that's really top on the market. Uh, we also have uh, machines with tool changers, be it our VMC or VLCMT series of machines. Um, where we have a full tool changer and we can really do anything that your uh, conventional uh, milling machine can do as well. The next question is what size of maximum and minimum outer diameter of this machine, uh, so the VL3 Duo, can be done? The VL3 Duo has a, has a working area, so you can put in uh, work pieces of a maximum diameter of 150 millimeter and a maximum work piece length of 110 millimeters. So this is the maximum OD, 150 millimeters. Um, and the minimum, I would say, is, is around 20, maybe a little less. Daniela, what would you say? What is the minimum? Yeah, the minimum of the RPMs of the chucks, it would be not less than 15 or 20 millimeters. It's the minimum of the diameters. Yeah. The spindle runs with uh, 5,000 RPMs. So this is, I think, also um, um, interesting to know. The VL3 Duo has the possibility to be equipped with two different kind of main spindles. One comes with 18 kilowatts 
Uh, and the second one comes with 32 kilowatts and 255 newton meters at 40% duty cycle. So yeah, this flexibility we offer at the VL3 Duo. So just one more point on the VL3 Duo. Bjorn said 150 millimeters on diameter and 110 millimeters on length. You know, we can always kind of play with things a little bit. If we have favorable clamping, we also have some ways to play with sheet metal a little bit. I think we've gone up to about an eight inch diameter part and a workpiece length of, I think, of 130 millimeters. So we can always cheat things a little bit, but we do need to look at the application specifically to uh, to find out if that's possible. Yeah, yeah, Kirk, okay. you're right. I also remember some special cases where we uh, also... Yeah, extended this uh, uh, the the dimensions of the uh, which are mentioned in the catalog. So I also know that Emac LRC uh, always offers solutions to our customers, and there's always some some room. Yeah, Emac yeah. is coming from the customized world. Also with the model of standard machines, <coughs> we can do always a little bit on customizing. That we are really flexible and something some tolerances we can arrange them and make it a little bit higher sometimes. Yeah, thanks a lot. We go on with my presentation. We are coming now to the next steps. We are, I'm showing here the rolling tools. Why we do our rolling? We are doing rolling for, to have a higher surface quality and more, let's say, more rigid the, 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 the workpiece, have more stability in the workpiece. The rolling tools which we are using, we are taking from supplier like EcoRoll or Bowplease. This is an example from a spherical turning tool which we have here also now presented. It's an inside turnical tool, which we are also using a lot of times in our real 3 dual machine. And now we are coming to a solution which we sold many years ago about a rolling process in our real 3 dual integrated. You can see here now in the first steps, the turning operations, and later there are coming some rolling and outside rolling and inside rolling operations, which you can see here on the screen now. Now we are turning inside the diameter and after that we are going to the next operation which is doing the, the rolling of the spherical. How do you clamp the bevel gears without a diameter flash from forging? So this is uh, always a little bit tricky in the case of side and pinion gears. Um, you know, in practice, these gears are all going to have different quality depending on the die set, the life of the die, um, different presses, whatever the case may be. Um, so customers need to be aware of what the quality and the range of uh, the incoming components are going to be. Um, it may be necessary to have some sort of uh, pre deburring uh, or flash removal. It just depends a little bit on the, the range of forgings that are going to be received. But nonetheless, you know, that's something that can also be integrated into an EMAG cell uh, depending on the application. So again, this goes back to project specific type details uh, and ensuring that uh, we know what the parameters are. That being said, you know, even with the, the vertical pickup benefit of the machine and the spindle loading itself um, you probably didn't pick it on the video but you know as we are loading the part and engaging that negative profile of the component that plate which is supporting the part is on a set of die springs and it's floating depending on um, the uh, the locators so the locators and all the z-axis force are going to get on the part and that plate is going to swivel um, and float um, depending on uh, the, the workpiece uh, variations. So if there is a significant amount of flash on the component, that plate is not going to make, make its uh, nominal travel, and it's going to alert the machine that something's not right. And if and it hasn't made that travel, then it's not going to clamp that part and take it into the work zone and then crash a tool or something like this. So we do have protection built into the load-on-load -load system due to the inher inherent architecture of the machine doing its self-loading process. Yeah, I go over to the next step the next page in the presentation as you can see emac can sell not only solutions with one standalone machine we have also specialized on solutions which means turnkey solutions here we can see the diff case lines which we are really successful in this business we sold this line many times 
we have here the possibility to connect three, four or five machines with our flat gantry system and manufacture uh, div cases age 120 seconds. We have one finished part in this div case line. The big benefit of EMAC is we have a flat gantry system in the background which we can connect with our automation. This is a washing box or a gauging unit or what else, whatever you have. In the next step, we can see here, um, this is the bigger brother wheel five dual. It's the bigger brother of the wheel three dual that we can turn ring gears up to diameter around about 250, 260 millimeters. This is a machine which includes also our flat gantry system track motion in the background. We have here two independent working areas and the square meter around about, about the the cell is around about 35 square meters and each minute we have one finished part in the cell. So what I'd like to say about that, you know, we started speaking about uh, side and, and uh, pinion gears, which only require a, a turning operation. Um, and Daniele showed you the line for the complete differential housing, you know, turning side A, turning side B, putting the part between centers, maybe roughing out the uh, the bore holes going on to a VL6 to turn the internal profile of the sphere as well as finish uh, the windows or the, the side bores. You know, that shows that EMA can really put those systems together, number one, number two. The second slide that Daniela just showed you was the, the ring gear. Um, what happens after the machining of the ring gear and the machining of the diff housing is the, the laser welding of those two components. So we really haven't highlighted that today, um, but clearly within the EMAG world, um, you know, this, this component, this assembly partially demonstrates, you know, our, our mission statement, being the best provider of manufacturing systems for precision metal components. Precision metal components being the internal gears, the ring gear, the differential housing, putting that all together in a cell, laser welding it. Outside of uh, those technologies, you know, EMAG has many more to offer, be it induction hardening, uh, electrochemical machining, um, grinding. There are so many technologies for round parts, which EMAG offers. It really gives us a lot of potential to provide those complete systems and really the suite of technologies around round parts. Many thanks to Björn, Daniela and Kirk. And welcome back to our audience. How do you ensure part accuracy after a tool change? So I'll, I'll go back again to the, uh, the tool probe that sits between the work area and the load on load area. Um, it's a great benefit to have this on board our machine. Um, that probe is in a protected space. It's not in the machining area. A lot of standard lathes out there today have uh, tool probes. You change the tool, you probe the tool, it makes an offset, you machine a part, and you get a good part, hopefully. Um, a lot of machines are not configured with the tool probe, and the typical procedure would be for an operator to cut a part, measure a part, make a tool offset. Um, in either case, um, last time I, I knew our customers, you know, are really selling good quality parts to their customers. They're not selling good quality tools. So the EMAG principle is to use that tool probe to ensure we have a good part. So in the case of a tool change, the operator says, I just changed tool 01, and I'm cutting an OD as an example. The machine knows that you just changed tool 1. It means you're going to cut the diameter now at a control cut diameter, which is oversize. After you get done machining it, you're going to bring that to the tool probe. Or I'm sorry, the probe. You're going to measure that diameter, and whatever the deviation is from the nominal versus the actual measured, you're going to make a tool set off, offset automatically, go back in the machining area, go to final depth, come back out, measure it, ensure that you're within your statistical control limits, and off to the races you go. So three very critical things here. One, you don't have an operator mismeasuring a part. You don't have an operator misentering an offset on a part. Mm -hmm. And number three, your machine keeps running. That green light is always on. You're always running in production. You don't have to stop um, for an operator to inspect a part, perhaps create a scrap part, perhaps create a second and a third scrap part by mismeasurement or misentering of tool offsets. So it's a great tool to have that uh, probe on board the machine. IDs, ODs, heights, it can all be automated without any operator intervention. Uh, in the case of the VL3 Duo, where you have 12 tool stations on the turret, uh, you can also use sister tooling. It means you open your door one time per shift, and you change out all your tools, and you index automatically at the end of your tool life to the next tool. 
You do that control cut automatically. Again, the green light stays on. You're really running hands off through the, the production day. Is a dual type clamping pressure system available? Yeah, especially for the real street dual, we have done many systems or many types of parts where we are using for the roughing, especially higher pressure. And then later in the finishing operation, we are, we, we are choosing a lower pressure of the clamping situation. And then we have done this many times. This is absolutely no problem. We have also chucks sometimes, which has on the top side a higher pressure on, and on the bottom side a lower one, uh, especially for two level chucks. This is a really common situ uh, solution in our machine. What is more or less the machine hour rate compared to standard machines? So just to be clear, you know, everything we've discussed so far today from the EMAG standpoint are standard machines from the EMAG uh, perspective. Uh, means that we can offer uh, the suite of standard machines or when it's appropriate, also offer uh, customized machines. Uh, and that's a great benefit of working with EMAG. You know, if there is something super special, the application, the process, the technical specifications of the actual mechanical equipment, controls equipment, we can offer customized solutions. Um, but also for the broad market uh, where things are becoming more and more competitive, especially in regards to these low cost pieces of side and pinion gears, our standard machines really do offer a very economical solution versus a full blown customized unique bill of material type solution. But again, we can offer that uh, as well. We have a product for machining where roughness is the main issue. During machining, there will be a lot of metal chips. What technology do you offer along with the machine to avoid chips to struck with tooling or workpiece? Yeah, this is the typical e-bag business, high volume, high chips uh, or high, high chip removal rate. And yeah, first of all, Kirk mentioned it uh, some minutes ago that we have a big advantage of our vertical spindle concept. So if you have ID turning or, or a boring operation, the chips fall directly out of the, the workpiece. So this is a very big advantage compared to horizontal machines. And of course, we are also offering different kind of uh, nozzles. Uh, Air, uh, air or water through the spindle uh, is also a possibility to get rid of the of the chips. We can flush the working area. We can blow off the the pickup um, station. So we are very familiar with this, and uh, we have a lot of different kind of solutions. Yeah, how Bjorn said, we have a lot of solutions done. We have coolants through the spindle. Then we have also some nozzles where we can blow with air. Uh, we have pipes with coolant in the working area. Then we can go also. When we are doing low unloading the part, we can rotate the turret at 360 degrees, that the chips fall down into the chip conveyor. Yeah, there we have done a lot of solutions, and uh, we are, let's say, really flexible. And in the most cases, we find here a solution that the customer is, at least is satisfied. What is the probe repeatability? So the probe repeatability is two to three microns uh, in nominal applications. Um, that can be tightened up if you go to a shorter probe, but if you go to a shorter probe, then you have limited reach. Um, likewise, if you go to a longer probe length, then that two to three microns opens up a little bit. So, you know, the thing to, to remember is, you know, we, we operate, you know, typically in the, the range of, let's say, plus or minus double digits of microns. Um, so you do lose a couple microns uh, in regards to the repeatability of the probe. Um, but if I'm doing a true CPK setup, everything's going to go to my CMM room and uh, have a, a proper inspection all said and done. Um, so anything right around plus or minus 10 microns and more, the probe is uh, certainly adequate for, for running in those tight tolerance type applications. Is there any error proofing system handled by EMAC to ensure correct part type on machine load? First of all, we can, we can offer some solutions in order to ensure that at the pickup we pick the part correctly so we can use uh, we can make use of uh, visual or optical cameras we can make use of sensors uh, also there's a possibility of um, if we have air through the spindle um, uh, to to check um, inside the chuck if the if the if the workpiece is uh, picked up in a correct way so we are offering offering different kind of solutions uh, daniela you are more in the yeah. field yeah, we have also a lot of sensors which shows is this the part in has the right height, uh, right length, or is the part too high and the machine stops immediately. Then we are also controlling the jobs 
the length of the jaws or the jaws too much out of the chuck body and the machine also can stop there. We have two or three function, including the function which Bjorn mean uh, with the air sensing, which controls the loading unloading position of the part. Now, I'll also mention if uh, we go back to uh, Bjorn, right over his shoulder, we show a ring gear. Uh, and in the case of our laser welding cells, um, it's very common that there are different variants of the ring gear and the corresponding pinion gear for different applications. So it's very common in our laser welding cells that we're taking a camera to the component to take a picture of the parts uh, before it goes into the laser welder to ensure that we have the right number of teeth, the right configuration, whatever the case may be. So in regards to airproofing from part A to part B, if we are gonna be running in a changeover environment uh, that has some uh, hands-off um, expectation, uh, putting in some airproofing in the automation side of uh, the cell uh, with the camera as another solution as well. Does the machine have the ability to measure the features of the bevel gears like mounting distance, bores, spherical profile, hub diameter, etc.? and feedback to the machine back for autocorrection? So yes and no. I mean, the probe is a very useful tool, but is not intended to be a replacement for a CMM. So in regards to the bore diameter, yes, no problem. The spherical profile, no way. Uh, the probe also does not function uh, as a dynamic probe either. You're not gonna check a roundness or a run out um, on, with this probe. But in regards to the feedback, yes. So let me just go a little bit deeper into what that feedback looks like. So if you're running nominally in production, you have the ability to use that probe um, 1 in 10, 1 in 20, 1 in 30, depending on what your tool life, tool stability situation is. You have your upper and lower tolerances, and then you have your statistical control tolerances. If you're running within that statistical control, floating around, everything's happy. If you get outside of the statistical control but are still within the tolerance limits, then the machine's gonna make a correction to bring it back down to nominal. If you happen to get a situation where a part is outside of tolerance, one way or the other, um, the machine will stop, it'll inform the operator that something's not right, a chipped insert, whatever the case may be. Um, but to be clear, that feedback from the OD, ID, face height uh, type, um, dimensions that we do get direct feedback to the machine. How long does the machines run autonomously? This depends what kind of solutions we have. We have done for OEMs 30 minutes independently. We can go over five, six hundred parts that a machine can run with a lot of sister tools on the turret mounted also over one shift. There we are really flexible. We have a row part or finished part conveyor we are, which we can customize and load parts until five, six hundred or four hundred parts, this is absolutely no problem to go over one shift or many hours. How to correct sizes on outer diameter, inner diameter and faces? How is the interlink for multi-spindles since the turret is fixed? Again, that probe um, is checking both of the parts independently. In the case of the VL1 twin, as we, we started earlier, the X and Z axes of each spindle are totally independent. So when it's checking uh, part A, that's going to go to X1 and Z1 for any corrections that may be required. And likewise for spindle B, that's going to go to X2 and Z2 um, for the direct offsets at the machine. Do you have any data in regards to efficiency when comparing a self-loading machine to a manually loaded machine? It's huge, right? I mean, this is this is uh, where we're at in manufacturing today. You know, it's a competitive world. Everybody's trying to make the cost, uh, the, the part for the least amount of cost. And uh, in today's environment, especially here in the U.S., where we have pre-COVID, you know, record low unemployment, finding operators um, has been incredibly challenging. So just from being competitive, one needs to automate today um, due to demand power. In regards to efficiency, um, you know, the EMAG system from a technical efficiency standpoint, the machine is going to run at 98%. From an OEE pers perspective, you know, this is totally going to be dependent on uh, process, how many tools you have, so on and so forth. You know, if I look at a, a, a pinion or a, a side gear, you know, with this limited number of tools, pretty predictable process, you know, you should be looking at a 90% system OEE. Um, and if you compare that with a, a manual 
uh, loaded type solution. You know, I, you can go anywhere with these. You know, some shops are going to run more efficiently and more diligently uh, running manually, um, but you can lie to yourself all day long. You're just not going to be as efficient. Um, people still need to use restroom breaks. People still need to eat lunch. Um, people are still going to chat at the water cooler and leave those machines unattended with a red light versus a green light. So, you know, the, the question was tied uh, or tied back to the one previously, the autonomy running on the machines. That's the inherent configuration of an EMAG machine. Um, we're showing pretty high volume type parts today. Um, but even in smaller shops, when you have a simple standard VL4 or VL3 Duo, um, you know, these simple loop conveyor type solutions are still going to offer shops that are setting up for 50 or 100 pieces at a time the ability to load up that loop conveyor, load up that stacker table and walk away and set up the other machine or go check a part in another machine. But most importantly, keep that green light on. It just pains me when I go into shops that are still manually loading in today's environment and are running some sort of production and to see these expensive machine tools sitting idle, doors open, waiting for an operator to feed them. It, it blows my mind that uh, shops still operate in, in this manner today. So by all means, self-loading with EMAG, be it uh, high volume autonomous running cells for a full shift or simple loop conveyors with EMAG, it's going to be far, far more efficient than a manual a loaded machine for sure. What kind of additional processes do you offer? For example, like gear cutting? Yeah, this is a, a, a question um, which is not really dedicated to the bevel gears. At the bevel gears, we only need our turning technology, but Kirk already mentioned we are offering different kind of technologies like turning, milling, gear hobbing, laser welding, electrochemical machines, uh, um, induction hardening machines. And um, we always have the philosophy to deliver our customers a solution from the raw part to the finished part. If we take, for example, a gear, which normally is first of all soft turn, first side, soft turn, second side, then gear hopped, uh, induction hardened, hard turn grinded. So this is our philosophy so that we can deliver for specific strategic parts the whole process chain. And yeah, of course, we can we can offer uh, gear hobbing and and also uh, other technologies like laser welding, for example. How not okay parts will be identified by robot or by measuring system? Is there any program given for machine and robot, and how is it interlinked? Uh, we have done solutions where we are where the robot gets a feedback from the gauge uh, that the part is not correct measured, then the robot takes the part and brings in another okay tube and gets out of the machine. Uh, these are the most common solution. And yeah, he gets directly from the control of the gauging unit a signal to the control of the robot. And then he brings the part to the not okay tube. This is the most common solution that we have in our systems. Thanks, Daniele. Kirk, do you want to add something maybe? No, you know, I, it goes back to the statement previously, you know, anything is possible when we start speaking about uh, external automation, robot cells, gantry cells, you know, that's the, the, the application where something special is required. And if something special is required, then anything is typically possible. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Here's the customer who prefers gantry automations. And can you also offer gantry automations? So yes, absolutely. Um, but I do want to be clear with EMAG self-loading system, our spindle will always be loading itself from the conveyor, the shuttle, or the swivel table, as we saw uh, in the case of the VL1 twin. You know, it's paramount for us um, that that spindle is loading itself. That's the core architecture of our machine that brings so many benefits. So from the standpoint of the broad industry in a horizontal gantry um, feeding the spindle, the answer is no. However, uh, it's very common that our machines are linked into uh, other processes, either upstream or downstream, and those parts may be conveyed via gantry. And that gantry can feed onto our conveyor, our shuttle, whatever, no problem. But that being said, we uh, just recently sold one of our spindle down machines, which is totally different than what we're speaking today. Um, and in that case, you know, we have integrated a third-party uh, gantry to load our VM9 uh, machine. So 
again, it's possible. Anytime we speak about automation, there's, you know, dozens of ways to skin that cat. Anything is possible. Okay. Thank you so far. As far as I can see, there is right now no further questions, but here is uh, other contact details where you can contact us after the webinar. And we have now reached at the end of our webinar and hope you were able to take some interesting impulses with you. Soon you can find the webinar on YouTube where already other webinars from us are uploaded. And we would like to thank you once again for your participation, also in the name of our experts in the studio and the US. And from our side, take care. And if you want to, until next time, goodbye.